This lesson is on inertial navigation system errors. Firstly, we need to remind ourselves how the information flows in the INS in order to work out what the sources of error will be. The accelerometer is mounted on a platform which is stabilized and north orientated by gyroscopes. It detects accelerations which are passed to the first stage integrator. Here they are integrated into velocity. One feed of this velocity is taken forward to the second stage integrator, where it is converted to distance gone and added to the present position, thereby generating a new present position. A parallel feed of the velocity is fed backwards through a V over R feedback loop, where it is converted to the omega term which is used to rotate the gyro to keep the platform perpendicular to the local gravity vector. The same sequence is taking place simultaneously in the east channel, the only difference being the addition of a secant multiplier to convert the easterly distance gone, or SE, into change of longitude. So, where are the possible sources of error? There are six. We'll explain them in more detail in a moment, but first we'll list them. These errors are platform tilt, accelerometer bias, integrator error, leveling gyro topple, initial azimuth misalignment, and azimuth gyro drift. Let's start at the beginning. Firstly, the platform may not be perfectly level. Platform tilt can also be known as initial leveling misalignment. The leveling process during alignment is very accurate. Ideally, it should be within about 6 seconds of arc. This is 1 600th of a degree. Nevertheless, it is a compromise with the requirement for a reasonably short alignment time. On completion of the alignment, the platform may not be perfectly level. Accelerometer bias is next. The accelerometers are designed to give zero output for zero input, if properly leveled. However, due to manufacturing imperfections, there may be some slight output when the accelerometer is perfectly stationary and level. This is called accelerometer bias. Next, we'll look at integrator error. For a zero input into an integrator, there should be a zero change of output. Again, due to manufacturing imperfections, there may be some slight scaling error. Taking the second stage integrator as an example, suppose the velocity input were exactly 400 knots for exactly one hour. If the distance gone output to the present position display were 401 nautical miles instead of 400, that would be an integrator scaling error. Integrator error can be present in both the first stage and the second stage integrators. The next error to consider is leveling gyro topple. We said that the platform and gyro might not be initially perfectly level. However, the gyro may also topple from its start position. With the accuracy to be expected of IN quality gyros, the topple rate would be of the order of only one hundredth of a degree per hour. But nevertheless, it is finite and would have an effect on the output. Apart from leveling, there is also the heading output to consider. Horizontal direction is called azimuth. So this error is called initial azimuth misalignment. Gyro compassing usually results in an initial alignment accuracy of about 0.1 of a degree. This is very accurate compared with a gyro magnetic flux valve heading, but even one tenth of a degree introduces appreciable errors. Finally, there is azimuth gyro drift. In addition to any initial misalignment error, the azimuth or heading gyro may also drift. This drift rate would typically be of the order of only one hundredth of a degree per hour. But as with the topple, it is finite and would have an effect on the output. So this comes to six input errors, or seven if we split the integrator error into first stage and second stage integrators. We are now going to see what effect they have on the output data. The first error we're going to look at is platform tilt. But before we do, we need to modify our diagram slightly. 
we shall want to see what effect these errors have on acceleration, velocity and position. The basic pattern is unchanged. We still have an accelerometer on a platform. The output is acceleration. But this time, we've put an imaginary meter in, so that we can see what's happening to the acceleration. With the needle at the 12 o'clock position, that means no output. If it is over to the left, that means a positive acceleration. If it is over to the right, it means that there is a negative acceleration. The acceleration goes to a first stage integrator, where it becomes velocity. The velocity goes onwards to the second stage integrator. But again, we can monitor it with our next imaginary meter. And again, vertical means zero output. Left means positive. And right means negative. Here's the second stage integrator, with its output of distance, for which we use the same convention. It's just easier in this diagram to see a needle presentation than changing digits for latitude and longitude. Finally, there's the V over R feedback loop. And here is the gyro. So now let's see what effect is caused by an initial levelling misalignment or platform tilt. Imagine that we are on the ground, alignment has just completed, and we switch the MSU to navigate mode. Here's the basic diagram. But unfortunately, on completion of the alignment, there is some levelling error. The component of gravity will be misinterpreted as a false acceleration. So let's show this false acceleration on our meter. This acceleration will be passed to the first stage integrator where it will be integrated into velocity. And then to the second stage integrator so that it will be integrated into change of position. At the same time, the velocity is passed back along the V over R feedback loop. The system can't tell that we are still on chocks, and this is a false velocity. So it assumes that the aircraft is travelling around the curvature of the Earth, and slowly brings the platform to the level. Which means that the source of the false acceleration is removed. You might think that this has solved the problem. The platform is now level, and there is no false acceleration. However, it hasn't. We have a build-up of velocity. The way that an integrator works is that if you have zero acceleration going in, it doesn't mean that you have zero velocity going out. It means that you have zero change of velocity. Therefore, the velocity continues to be passed to the second stage integrator and to the position display, displacing the position further. And it also continues to be passed back along the V over R loop, thereby rotating the platform as far over in the opposite sense as it was at the start. So the acceleration is now negative. This will become a negative velocity, which will be integrated to reduce the distance error and fed back to bring the platform back to the level. However, we still haven't finished. We still have a velocity in the system, which will be fed back to drive the platform to its original position. So the system is now in precisely the same configuration as it was at the moment of selecting Navigate. The whole loop has oscillated one full cycle to return to its initial configuration. It will continue to oscillate in this manner until the INS is switched off. We have had an apparent change of position and then a return to the original position, even though the aircraft has not actually moved. This type of periodic error pattern is called a Schuler oscillation. This is the Schuler pattern of error caused by platform tilt. It is sinusoidal in form. Two cycles of oscillation are shown in this picture, but in practice the oscillation will continue until the INS is shut down at the end of the day. The distance error starts at zero at the moment of selecting navigate then increases to half of its full displacement after a quarter of a cycle, 
reaches its fullest displacement at the halfway point of the cycle, then reduces back to half displacement at three quarters of the way through, and finally reduces to zero at the end of the cycle. Each cycle takes 84.4 minutes. This never changes because it is based on the constants in the V over R feedback loop. These are the value of gravity and the radius of the Earth. Therefore, it does not matter whether your INS was designed by Honeywell, Delco, Lytton, or anyone else. It will have to have a V over R feedback loop to keep the platform level as it travels over the Earth. And if the platform is not level at the start, there will always be an oscillation with a period of 84.4 minutes. This is called the Schuler period. The maximum value of the Schuler error does not increase with time. Whatever the amplitude of the first cycle, all subsequent cycles will have the same amplitude. The oscillation is self-sustaining because the system is resonating at its natural frequency. Most people find the explanation of Schuler errors using the moving diagram a little complicated and you are not expected to be able to remember it in detail. This is why the pendulum analogy is popular. When we discussed platform stabilization in an earlier lesson, we said that the V over R feedback loop could be likened to a large pendulum with a length equal to the Earth's radius with the platform bolted on at right angles. The bob of the pendulum remains at the center of the Earth. Then, as the aircraft travels, the circular motion of the rigid part of the pendulum keeps the platform level. Continuing with this analogy to explain Schuler's errors, if the platform is not level at the start, then this is like starting with the pendulum off-center. When the pendulum is released, it will swing with a period of 84.4 minutes. As the aircraft travels round the Earth, the Schuler loop will still try to keep the platform leveled with the local horizontal which is what it's designed to do, but it will have an unwanted Schuler oscillation superimposed onto it. Let's now see which of our errors will give a Schuler pattern. Firstly, we'll remind ourselves of the full list. Then we'll look at the feedback loop to see what caused the platform tilt oscillation error. The problem was caused by a feedback of false velocity through the V over R loop. So if any of the input errors gives us a false velocity, we will get a Schuler oscillation. Let's look at what could cause a velocity error. As we have seen, the platform might not be level. Secondly, there might be an accelerometer bias. And finally, there might be first stage integrator error. These are the only three. The combination of contributions from all three gives us our Schuler error. These errors are also known as bounded errors because they do not increase with time. We'll now go on to unbounded errors. There are other errors and they do not follow this sinusoidal pattern. Instead, they get worse with time. The second stage integrator is a good example. It is outside the V over R feedback loop. Suppose an aircraft were to fly at exactly 400 knots for an hour. But the second stage integrator were to output 401 nautical miles distance gone. Then, after two hours, the aircraft would have actually flown 800 nautical miles. But the integrator would have output 802. After three hours, the true distance is 1,200 nautical miles. But the integrator would have output 1,203, and so on. This kind of error is a different pattern. It is called a ramp or unbounded error. Another obvious example of an unbounded error is initial azimuth misalignment. Clearly, the further you go, the worse the cross-track error gets. There are four sources of unbounded error, and they combine to form a ramp pattern. In practice, Schuler errors and ramp errors occur at the same time. 
so we have a ramp pattern like this, with a Schuler ripple superimposed on top of it, so that the complete error pattern looks like this. Here is a summary of INS errors. Bounded errors oscillate about a mean value and have a sinusoidal form with a period of 84.4 minutes. They do not increase with time. They consist of platform tilt, accelerometer bias, and first stage integrator error. Unbounded errors increase with time. Their form is a ramp. They consist of initial heading misalignment, leveling gyro topple, azimuth gyro drift, and second stage integrator error. Unlike our earlier diagrams, which were idealized, this is an actual plot of INS against GPS on a test flight. The pattern can be clearly seen. There is a basic ramp increasing at approximately one nautical mile per hour, with a one mile Schuller oscillation superimposed on it. How can we correct or remove these errors? The answer is that we can't. All of these bounded and unbounded errors result from limitations in the accuracy of the components of the INS. They arise from the accelerometers, the integrators and the gyros. They can all be considered to be a more sophisticated form of instrument error. There is nothing that can be done about them within the INS itself, except to improve engineering standards. And this did happen with the evolution of better and better manufacturing techniques during the 70s and 80s. Even with these errors, the general accuracy of an INS is good compared with previous systems. This plot shows only an 8 mile error after 9 hours of flight. For a standalone system, this is very good. However, from the 90s onwards, two developments occurred. One was the introduction of the ring laser gyro to replace the old tune rotor gyros. Systems using these new gyros were usually called inertial reference systems. We shall cover the ring laser gyro and the IRS in more detail in the next lessons. The other was the idea of using the INS or IRS as only one component of a multi-sensor system and to have a method of extracting the most probable position from a combination of all of the inputs. This multi-sensor system is part of the Flight Management System, or FMS for short. And the method of establishing the most probable position from a variety of inputs is called Kármán filtering. The later generation of inertial systems, which are generally known as inertial reference systems, or IRS, are usually part of an integrated flight management system, FMS. In the Flight Management Computer, or FMC, there are usually two or three IRSs, each generating its own present position. These IRS positions are compared with independent sources, such as Global Positioning System, or GPS, and computer-generated calculation of cross-cut positions, which have been obtained from ground-based radio beacons called distance measuring equipment. The computer automatically selects those DME stations along the route which will give the best crosscut and calculates an independent new position several times a minute. The crosscut positions are called DME, DME positions. Not all inputs are always available. DME is a line of sight system, so it can be blocked by hills or the curvature of the Earth. GPS can have blank spots. A process known as Kármán filtering produces a statistically most probable position known as the FMC position. From this FMC statistical best estimate of position, it is possible for the FMC to establish an error trend over a period of time and to build mathematical models of both the Schuler and the unbounded error propagation pattern. This is then used in the computation of future computer-generated positions. Kármán filtering is complicated 
and does not lend itself to broad simplifications. However, it is important to realize that the FMC position is not the average of the IRS and DME, DME or GPS position, but is computer generated using a sophisticated statistical algorithm. Let's summarize this lesson. We reminded ourselves of the basic data flow diagram. Then we identified the sources of error. We looked at sources of error within the V over R loop. And we saw why Schuler oscillations happen. We reminded ourselves of the pendulum analogy for normal platform stabilization and then extended it to include the platform not being level at the start. The Schuler period is always 84.4 minutes and the maximum displacement at the successive 42.2 minute points is always the same. We then said that there were other errors that don't fit this pattern and that these are known as unbounded errors. This is the summary of errors which you must remember. They give an error propagation pattern like this. On a standalone INS, these errors cannot be removed. They can be minimized by the use of more accurate components and expensive engineering techniques. However, the later generations of inertial systems are only one of several sources of position in a flight management system. And a statistically most probable position is computer generated by the Kármán filter in the FMS. However, the FMC position is not the average. This concludes our study of INS. The next lesson goes to look at its successor, the IRS.